Welcome to the ministry of Barefoot Church. I'm Clay Neesmith, the pastor here at Barefoot Church. And man, we hope what you experience here today uh, will encourage you, motivate you, and inspire you in a great, great way. We have been announcing for several weeks that we were going to do this service and we were going to gather to make commitments. And you are here today. Come on. You are here. Uh, There are some people that weren't able to be with us today, and and that's okay. Uh, They'll be back maybe with us next weekend, and maybe you're viewing around uh, the world somewhere online because you're out of town. But guess what? We've got it all set up today so you can uh, participate. And, you know, I'm expecting God to do the amazing today in and through our church. He's already been at work over uh, the the last several weeks. Uh, Many of us have been praying diligently Uh, This prayer, God, what do you want to do through me? God, what do you want to do through us together? And today we're going to have the opportunity uh, to make our three-year commitments, our contributions, and we're going to do that towards the end of the service. And you should have received a card when you came in today. And again, I want to make it clear today why we are committing to such an audacious vision. And it's it's simply this. It's because it is what we are created for. We are created to be in this earth to promote God's presence throughout the earth. And God uniquely created both men and women as in his image is what the Bible says so that we can come together and permeate this earth with his amazing presence. It's why you are human. It's why God has has knit you together in your mother's womb. It's, It's why you were birthed on this planet is so that you can come to God and God has provided a way back to him because the first man and the first woman got off target, missed the mark of God's glorious standard in the garden, but God provided for the human race a way to come back to him. And that way is known as Jesus. He gave his life on a cross so we could be forgiven of missing the mark of God's glorious standard. And we could put our faith and our trust in who he is, what he has done for us, and also his amazing resurrection because he conquered death, he conquered sin, and he conquered the grave. And we celebrate who he is because he has brought many of us back to God and we can get a download of what our assignment is here in this earth, which is to be image bearers. Come on, somebody. And we can reflect who God is in the community that he has placed us in. And so, again, I I wanna make it clear why we're taking this next step. Because we don't just gather, we gather to make a difference in the community that God has placed us in. And, And you know what, God is adding to his family daily. God is adding to his community, to his church daily. And if you don't belong to his family yet because you haven't trusted his way back to him, his name is Jesus, You know, maybe today would be the day that that you begin to do that. But we're here simply as promoters. We're here to promote the name of Jesus and what he has done for us. And I can tell you right now, he brought me back to God at the age of 32. And my life has been transformed and changed. And I have a new outlook on why I'm here on this planet. And I hope you do too. So I want to talk to you about commitment today, doing your part, because every part matters. Every part is significant. Every family unit in the house today can really make a difference. And if you're online, you can make a difference too. I want to title today's talk as Hope on a Rope. Hope on a Rope. If you have your Bibles with you, I'm going to invite you to open them up to Acts chapter 9. And Acts chapter 9 is all about uh, the early church. If you study your Bible at all, when you get to the Acts of the Apostles in the Bible, 
It's, it's simply about the birthing of the early church after Jesus uh, resurrected and ascended back to heaven and we see the church begin to spread, to permeate throughout the earth. And it started there in Jerusalem and Jesus gave a commission to his followers. He says, you'll be my witnesses uh, throughout the earth. He says here in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Can I tell you why we're here today? Because simply Jesus commissioned those people to be promoters of who he is in the earth. And, and many of us are sitting in this very room today because they began to follow through with what they were designed to do, what they were created to do. And we're still carrying that amazing, amazing message. But what happened whenever they began to promote God's way and God's purpose in Jerusalem, there began to be an outbreak of, of religiosity or the Jewish people, many of the Jewish people became against what we know as the church, the called out ones, and they began to actually persecute them because they had an idea of, of basically how to get to God instead of this idea of God coming to them. And the early church began to promote, no, Jesus came, he was God in the flesh, he resurrected from a grave, and if you'll just come back to God through him, then you know what, this, this is the good news that is for everybody in the earth. And some of the Jewish people who had been following, following legalism for many, many years, many, many generations, began to persecute that message, began to come against that message. And one of the uh, leading persecutors was a man named Saul. And, and Saul was a religious zealot. He was a man that, that knew the Jewish law inside and out. And one of his ultimate goals in life as the church began to blossom and began to grow was to stamp out Christianity, was to end it, was to basically do away with it. And he began to persecute people in, in Jerusalem. The Bible says that, that he was going after not just men, not just leaders, but also women. And he wanted all women and men put in chains if they were promoting this good news about a Jesus, but he happened to have an encounter. He happened to be brought into a, a, a vision of who God is. And that's where we're going to pick up in Acts chapter 9. Because as he was persecuting the church, the people of God, God showed up in his life in a vision and transformed him. I need you to know today that the power of God is simply amazing. And if, if God can come into your life, he's not in the business of just changing you. He's in the business of transforming you into his likeness. And this is what the Bible says. If you got your Bibles, let's start with Acts chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. The Bible says, Saul. Saul was uttering threats with every breath and was eager to kill the Lord's followers. So he went to the high priest. He requested letters addressed to the synagogues in Damascus. He has now left Jerusalem. He heard that there were some followers in Damascus about 150 miles away. And he went there asking, asking the leaders there. Uh, he, he asked for their cooperation in the arrest of any followers of the way he found there. He wanted to bring them, both men and women, back to Jerusalem, the Bible says, in chains. So Paul's mission was to track down any person. Saul's mission was to track them down and put them in chains to begin to basically hold them back from promoting who God was in the earth. Now keep in mind, these people were, were saying godly things sometimes. They were following legalism, but these followers began to talk 
about the way back to God wasn't through legalism, wasn't through religious practice, but was through Christ Jesus. And as they began to announce this, anybody following legalism, trying to get to God, that would probably upset them. Because what do you mean? I've been trying so hard. I've been working, 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 trying to get into the presence of God and, and you're telling me that God is so in love with the human race that he has come and made his presence among the human race and he will come into a person's life and forever transform their life. What are you talking about? We need to snuff that kind of message out. Come on. And can I tell you something that still happens today? is someone begins to promote the unmerited favor of God in somebody's life, no matter where they are, then what will happen is people say that's not the way to change. The way to change is trying harder. Now, what I want to declare to you today is when you meet the unmerited favor of God in your life, no doubt about it, change will happen. Because transformation is the business that God is in. He's not only into finding you. He's into transforming you into his likeness so you can be a promoter and get on with the vision that God has for your life. And, and so many people come to church and they say, hey, I want to trust God, but truly trusting God is coming back to him and following through what he's created for you to be. And, and, and so the, the, the writer here uh, the, the book of Acts says this Paul was on a mission. He wanted to stamp out Christianity. Now let's skip down to verse three and listen to what it says. As he was approaching, as he was approaching Damascus on this mission, which was to stamp out Christianity, a light from heaven suddenly shone down around him. He fell to the ground. He heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked, and the voice replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. You're trying to stamp out this good news about who I am. You're persecuting me, and I want to transform you. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The Bible goes on to say that Paul travels to the city. He meets a man named Ananias, and Ananias tells him basically about the power of, of Jesus. And, and the Bible says, in that moment, he began to be transformed. He began to be suddenly changed. And, and, and I need you to understand that that is what happens when you meet God through Christ Jesus. God begins to change you. Not from just being a persecutor, of Jesus's name, but he changes you from basically who you used to be into a brand new creation in Christ Jesus. So that, everybody say, so that. So that. Those are the two of the most key words in all of the scripture from front to back. And the reason he transforms you is so that you can get back to being who you were designed to be as a human being, whether you are male or female. Now, how is God extending this hope into the world today? My friends, it is through the church, the people of God, made up of all kinds of people. It's made up of different tribes, different tongues, and from different nations. It's made up of both male and female, young and old. And what's interesting is now we are the image bearers together. Everybody say together. Yeah. Unified around one purpose. See, see, this is the key. Because many, many times we try to be an image bearer by ourselves. And when you try to be an image bearer by yourself, you need to understand that God never created you to bear his image by yourself. He created us to be in, in harmony, in unity with the variations of how he has created us coming together. Come on. It's what the human race is for. And sharing with the world Amen. who God is. Yes. It is simply amazing. 
And man, if you could ever get that bullet point in your theology, the so that clause, it will change everything about what you do in life because you're not just transformed and forgiven just to be forgiven. You're forgiven for a purpose. And that purpose is to be a part. And to be a part, it means I, I participate. See, we don't see God sometimes, the power of God manifested in the world that we live in because it's not because God's power is in there. It's because participation is lacking. And again, it's not just about doing stuff. It's doing stuff with a purpose. It's turning on these lights with a purpose. It's singing the songs with a purpose. It's greeting with a purpose. It's parking with a purpose. It's showing hospitality with a purpose. It's, it's, it's staring the grits out in the lobby with a purpose. It's doing administration with a purpose. All of it's purposeful. But, but see, if, if we begin to, to not work together with one common purpose, we become silos and individuals. And can I tell you something? God is not about individual theology. He's about partnership. He's about us partnering together with him to be his representative in this earth. I told him earlier, we had a volunteer rally in here. And I said, a lot of the, the songs that are written are about me and I and my relationship with God. And every individual person needs an individual relationship with God. But the songs theologically really should say we and us instead of me and I, because it's an us game. Come on, it's an us game. Every part matters. And, and so in this world where the church was being uh, persecuted, Paul was trying to staff out Christianity. He, he had an encounter, Saul, who's later, you know, his, his name is used as Paul in the scripture because he had two names. It was Saul and Paul. One is just a Greek name and the other is basically a Hebrew name. And, and so it's, trans, it's basically translated as Paul from the, from the point on in Acts chapter 13 and beyond. Many people think Jesus changed his name. Jesus didn't change his name. Jesus just touched his heart and changed his life. And can I tell you something? When Jesus changes your life, no matter whether you live in a Hebrew culture or a Greek culture or an American culture, your, your earthly name is not what's significant. It's your outward life that matters in every part matters. Sweetie, every part matters. Sir, every part matters. And so, so now Saul, who is persecuting the church, he has this encounter with God and he begins to basically do amazing, amazing things. And I want us now to basically skip down to Acts chapter 19, verse 20. And I want us to see what the scripture says. The Bible says once he was transformed, once he met Ananias, his life was changed. Saul stayed with the believers in Damascus for a few days. In other words, the people he was persecuting is now the people that he is gathering with. And immediately he began preaching about Jesus in the synagogues. That would be the Jewish synagogues saying he is indeed the son of God. Now I want you to stop for just a moment and I want you to think about that transformation. He was on a mission and the people in Damascus and in Jerusalem understood what mission he was on. And many of the believers were afraid of this man named Saul because he was like, bro, I'm coming at you. And my goal in life is not for you just to tell me about Jesus. My goal in life is to put you in chains and drag your butt back to Jerusalem and throw you in a jail cell. He was an intimidating person. 
He was a person that was on a mission. He was hardcore. But he had an encounter with God. And he began to gather with the church. Now, I want you to know that many of those folks were still jacked up that Paul was in their midst because he was there, but he had been changed. He was Jewish like them. He was of the same bloodline as many of them. He, he was a fellow American. However, you know what? He had been transformed from a different kingdom. And my friend, whenever that kingdom began to be the rule and reign over his heart, and that king, his name is Jesus, began to change his life. Amen. He's like, look, I ain't against my own people, but I'm here to declare to you that we as a people have missed the mark. And it's not about our allegiance to Judaism. It's about our allegiance to King Jesus. And when we get our allegiance to King Jesus, he'll come in and change our life. Oh, keep in mind, many of the people didn't like his message. <laughs> they, they were like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You're going against us now. And so some of the high priests and the people in charge began to set out to not only do what he was going to do, they, they begin to set out to, to stamp him out because now he is underneath the influence of a different kingdom and he's sharing a message with his fellow Jews and anybody else that would receive what he had to say. He had been transformed. I, I need you to know that Jesus once said that sometimes you know what you gotta do? You, you, you gotta put uh, this, this bloodline thing, this, this family thing to the side. And, and you got to get Jesus as the king and the leader of the family. And then you need to bring you, your race, your family, the other nation, and everybody else underneath that leadership and change. What, what's Lord in your life? What's master in your life? Because Jesus once declared, you know what, sometimes you got to put some of that behind you in order to move forward and do what God has designed you to do. This is exactly what Paul's doing. He's not denying that he's Jewish. He's not denying of his heritage. He's not mad at all of that. But he's simply saying there is one that is greater and he has come into my life and he'll come into your life and he'll transform you and he'll bring you in. To something amazing. And he's simply inviting people to submit. But can I tell you something? When you tell someone that is driven and headed in their own direction, their own way, you know, they tend to be what, what, what I refer to myself sometimes as a know-it-all. It's my way or the highway. It's right. And, and honestly, I just need you to know when you encounter people like that, that their strong personality isn't going to back down. But the God of the universe can shift the personality. And then they can become a promoter of the good news. And when you tell a strong personality to submit, that's why some of you ladies don't like what the Bible says. Because you got what, you, you miss what, what it means. And it's not just submit to your husband and let him beat the crap out of you. It's to submit to one another. As the church submits to Christ and let Christ, as an illustration, let Christ be the Lord of your family and your life. But can I tell you something? Men and women alike, we all have strong personalities. We want to go in our own way and go in our own direction. And when you even mention the word submission, it's like, bro, you ain't putting me in the figure four. I ain't tapping out on nobody. See, 
God. God created you with desire. But what you need to do is, is get that desire in your heart turned around and headed in the right direction. It's honestly why many of our life is spinning out of control. Because we don't understand what it means to come underneath the leadership and lordship of Jesus and begin to commit our life to his purpose and plan here on earth as it is in heaven. We continue to go in our own direction. But Paul, he submits his life. The Bible says he begins to preach the good news. And then let's get down to, to verse uh, 24 in chapter 9. And look what it says there. It says, the priests, they were watching for him day and night at the city gate. So that, he, so that they could murder him. But Saul was, was told about their plot. So during the night, some of the other believers, pay close attention, this is what I want you to see today. Some of the other believers lowered him in a large basket through an opening in the city wall. See, what I want you to understand today is Paul had a strong personality, Saul had a strong personality. God transformed him, but God had also transformed some other people too. And, and a lot of people miss this in the Bible, but what this passage shows us is every part matters. I did a little research, and it's possible that the, the wall and where he was lowered out of a window in the walled city could have been approximately five stories high in our modern day culture. And they decided, hey, we gotta get him out of the city because uh, the priests and the leaders wanna take him out. But God wants to extend this hope into all the earth. Don't miss this. So, so they came up with a plan. They're like, hey, we can get together. Everybody say together. Yeah. And we can do our part. And we can tie some ropes to a basket and we can lower him down through this window opening so that he can escape. And now the good news, the hope, can begin to be extended wherever it goes. See, the Bible says that God gave a vision to Ananias when Ananias was afraid of Saul. And he says, Ananias, you need to share the good news with Saul because I have chose him and appointed him yes. before time ever began to be the good news bearer, the image bearer of my good news beyond the Jews to the Gentile world. And he's gonna be the forerunner that's gonna take this good news of Jesus into all the earth. And he's gonna do amazing things. So Ananias got the vision led Paul to Jesus and, and Paul now or Saul begins to meet with all the believers. Again, the priests want to kill him. The Jewish leaders wanted to kill him. They said, let's get together. Everybody say together yeah. and let's do our part. Now, how many of you know that the ropes they lowered him down in that basket with were significant and important? If you were dangling from five stories, how significant would it be for someone holding that rope? More so, how significant would it be for the person who tied the knot in the rope that you were dangling from? Or, or maybe even more so, how about the person that took the, the threads and the things and wove the rope together? Wouldn't you wanna make sure that they have more than a 60 pound fishing line, test fishing line. And they knew what they were doing. Can I tell you, every single part mattered. Because if one of those people would have let go of those ropes that tied the one in the basket that was being lowered to the ground, would they have let go of their part? More than likely, Paul, Saul in that particular time would have fallen five stories to his death. And so what I want to declare to you today is 
the Bible doesn't record the names of those people holding the rope. And in the story, we may miss as humans how significant they are. But I need you to know today that in God's great story, their participation and their part is significant in the story. It's yeah. as significant as the one that was in the basket that was to declare this hope to the nations. And, and so today, you're going to have the opportunity to commit and, and be a, a hope or a rope holder so that we can extend this hope to the world. And how we do that is we all do our part. We do what God says that we can do. That's why we've been praying, God, what do you want to do through me? God, what do you want to do through us? What is my part in this significant plan? And again, yes, we're going to build a campus. We're going to build a building. It's going to be amazing. We got a four and a half million dollar goal and it's going to be incredible. But what's more incredible is God wants each and every one of us to do our part and participation matters. Yeah, come on. And what if Paul would have said, look, I don't want to get in the basket. I just, I want to hold the rope. But he didn't say that. He did his part. He got in the basket. It's pretty significant. <laughs> but by the same token, what if one would have said, I don't want to hold the rope, but I want to get in the basket. It, it took all the parts working together. Every single piece of it down, down to the smallest, to the largest in order for this hope that was on the end of a rope to begin to get extended to the ends of the earth. And I can tell you right now, the mission hasn't changed. If God has called you out of darkness into the wonderful light and he has connected you with a group of believers, it is for one simple purpose. And it was, is to come together and work together to extend the hope of Jesus Christ. His name is above all names to the end of the earth. And my friends, that is pretty well the mission of this church because it's the mission for the human race that God has declared in Genesis 1. Be image bearers. It's about being something significant. It's about coming together with other people and, and doing our part. Now, now, sometimes when our part gets difficult, what we want to do is compare our part to somebody else's part. Or we want to compare our role to somebody else's role. But what if I just begin to ask God, what do you want to do through me? What do you want to do through my family? God, I submit myself wholeheartedly to you. The vessel I live in, the place you have planted me, the resources you have put in my hand, and God, how would you have me to participate with the others to make this reality of the good news permeate the place I am planted? My friend, it takes submission and it takes commitment. It takes participation. You want to see the power of God show up in your own life, in the community's life, in the world, then the, the lack isn't God wants to be powerful and wants his name to be powerful. Sometimes the lack is our willingness to participate. So what would God have you to do? And again, nobody may ever know your name. But what I want you to do is make a covenant, an agreement with your creator today. That's what we're asking people to do. So I'm sure that you have a name that somebody gave you. So what I'm going to ask us to do is prepare our hearts for this commitment in just a few moments. But how, how I want to do that is 
I want to kind of set this up by us getting out our pen and our piece of paper. And Mr. Eddie, y'all can wait just a few minutes on the, on the boxes, okay? But I want you to maybe get a pen out and a piece of paper out. And this will take you about a minute. And I want you to write your name or your family's name. There's some in the back of your seats there if you don't have a card. They have them there. And I want you to write your family's name, your email address, and your phone number on this card. I'm not asking you to write your three-year commitment to this vision at the moment. I'm just asking you to get your name on the card. Get your family's name on the card. And what we're going to do is we're not going to expose every single person's name, whether they give large or they give small to all of us because that's what's not important. But we do need commitment and we do need each other to get involved with this. And we do need us to have an agreement with God, okay? And so again, we have to have this information to collectively put together in order to take this next step and move forward. And I've told you that we have a goal of four, a goal of four and a half million uh, dollars to, to get this project rolling. Some of you have prepared today and you brought what we would refer to as first fruits or your first offering of your three-year commitment. And if you're online, maybe you've offered that too or, or you have that today. And we're gonna be taking up our first fruits offering. If you got it today and you wanna commit that first fruit of those first dollars of your three-year commitment, we're gonna need those on the front end to get it started. You can just simply grab an envelope in a few minutes and uh, put it, uh, put a check in, in, in there, or whatever means you're going to do it at the kiosk and you can drop it in the things at the end of the service day. Next week, we'll begin to have commitment envelopes, but over the next three weeks, we're going to be taking up our first fruits and on, on the 20th or so, we're going to uh, find out where we really are so we can declare to, to the groups that's going to be building the building, hey, you know what? We're ready to move forward and hopefully we're going to break ground in November or December. Come on, somebody. Now, that you wrote your name on there. I want to declare this, that we have did a, as much understanding as we can about how many, how many families would call Barefoot Church their home. And there's about 1,800 family units in the local area. That doesn't include the extended area that would call Barefoot Church their home. About... A third of those 1,800 families, about 500 of those families would call themselves families, not just people, would call themselves regular attenders of Barefoot Church. Now, we began to talk with some of the people and some of the people began to come to us and make what we refer to as early commitments. And about 15% of those 500 and something families, 15, I didn't say 50, about 15% have already committed towards the four and a half million. So just to encourage you today to see how when we come together, what it can begin to do. This is 15% of that 500 and something families. I wanna show you the totals up here on the screen. So let's go with it guys, make that thing work. Fifteen percent of the families have already committed. Two million three hundred and fourteen thousand seventy seven dollars. Over a three year period. Come on, somebody. So in just a moment, we're gonna be cutting these commitment boxes out around the auditorium. They're gonna be halfway down, they're gonna be up here. And we're gonna see what God can do. And we're gonna to commit together in just a few moments. But what I wanna do is, is, I want to encourage you today 
to begin to consider, prayerfully consider, what you're going to write for the description of your gift and your commitment level on the top of that card. You've written your name on the bottom. And then in just a few minutes after I tell you a quick story and you watch a video, you're going to have the opportunity to commit. Now, we're not asking you to just be emotionally driven today. We're asking you to prayerfully consider what God would have you to do to be in partnership with us for three years on this journey. How much of it would he have you to begin to bring in this week, next week, and the next week called First Fruits? And then over the next 36 months, how much of it would you be willing to commit? Maybe it's monthly. Maybe it's, you know, a small amount. Maybe it's a large amount. It's going to take all of us working together in order to make this happen. 15% of our church has already committed two point, let's call it three million dollars of the four and a half million. What could God do? What could he do? Could he blow our goal out of the water? And again, it's not about equal parts. It's about equal participation. It's about doing what God has given you to do, your family to do. It's not about equal shares. It's about equal sacrifice. And every part matters down to the smallest part to the largest part. Man, you know what? Our school here, a bunch of, a bunch of kids that are gathered together have already raised over the last three weeks $4,000 together <laughs> to commit to this. So today, I want to share with you that you have the opportunity to extend the hope of Jesus that is, is on a rope into the ends of the earth. And so how did Barefoot Church begin? How did it, how did it start? Can I tell you something? It was a couple of families that decided to hold the rope. And those families basically were in Columbia, South Carolina. Over 15 years ago, my family and I, we, we finished seminary in Columbia, South Carolina. And whenever we finished seminary, I went to work doing parking lot construction. I didn't have a ministry position or a, a job in a church. And I went to work in the middle of Walmart parking lots in the middle of the night, bringing Walmart parking lots up to ADA compliancy. Never knowing that when I come to Myrtle Beach, and I made these three stores. If you have a problem with the compliancy 15 years ago at this store, I did it, okay? Um, but all over this beach, up and down this Grand Strand, I brought all of those, all of those parking lots up to ADA compliancy. And I was doing it in Georgia, South Carolina, Alabama, and, and I was doing it all over those three states for this particular company. And I, and I finished my assignment. And I never knew that the doorway to doing my ministry assignment was found in Walmart parking lots in the middle of the night working for two, two families in the construction business. But can I tell you something? I did those, I, we, we did that diligently. In other words, I served in the spot God had me in a way that honored him. Yes, I was working for two families, two couples in a job. And I was making money for their company. But, but let me declare to you today, I was doing it on God's behalf. Come on, somebody. And I was in the Walmart parking lots with old ladies in the middle of the night, all kinds of people pulling up, drunk people. Why you got my parking space? Why you got it blocked off? Yelling, screaming, hollering at me. And did I know God was preparing me for ministry? Cussing, hollering. But I did it to the glory of God. Amen. Without complaining, without arguing, but by submitting myself to God's purpose and plan. I was a graduate student. And I found myself back out, what I would call in the wilderness, in the middle of the night. And God was paving the way for people to hold the rope 
so his good news could be getting extended to many, many families here. When I finished my assignment over that year, I was under contract for a year to bring so many Walmarts up to ADA compliancy. When I, when I finished my assignment, the two owners and their spouses of the company, four people, they called me and my wife basically into their presence and offered and said, look, we know you've gone to seminary and God's got hold of your heart and you're probably looking to start a church. They, we had talked about it some on the journey. And they said, so here's what we want to do. Your assignment is finished with bringing these stores up to ADA compliancy. And, and thank you for your service and your good work. But, but your commitment level, God has prompted our heart to hold the rope. And they said, if y'all will go, come on somebody. If your family will go to Myrtle Beach, North Myrtle Beach, and, and maybe start a church in a community that begins to extend the love of Jesus and who God is to the ends of the earth. What, what, what we wanna do is hold the rope. We wanna provide the financial resources for your family to go there for three years and plant this church called Barefoot Church. We didn't know it was gonna be called Barefoot Church then. So we made a move and they held the rope. And can I tell you something? They never came down here to administrate the church. They said, that's your part. Our part is to supply the resources and we're gonna supply the resources. And they went above and beyond and they supplied every single dollar for the 36 months they committed to. And I just want you to look around today at what this place looks like because four people were willing to hold the rope and come together to do something significant. My friends, your life may have been changed and people are extending, extending, extending. And many of you may have come on this journey and we keep extending, we keep extending, we keep extending. Today we're inviting you into this journey and this vision. So after this video, we're gonna begin to make our moves for our commitments. Check out the side screens. What I loved about it is that everybody is so friendly. There was a man at the front who would come out, he didn't know us from Adam, and he'd give us a hug. Wow, the first time um, we came, everything was just amazing. It was just a different atmosphere that we were used to. It's just welcomed, and like she said, we, we didn't experience that from where we used to come from. We just felt like we was a part. It, it really fills our heart to be working together and fellowshipping here. Our children, they would live here if they could, and this is where they want to be. So when you can have your kids want to be here with how the world is as crazy as it is today, I mean, where, where else would you want them to be? And when they want to and you're not dragging them, that's a whole game changer there. Honestly, we before we came to this church, we were kind of in a bad place in our um, in our marriage and um, when we got here it actually just the, the messages were different and it made us focus more on each other and on how to work through things right. instead of just brooding and just being upset with each other so it it definitely had a big impact on our lives you know, each of us has our reasons for being where you are, and God has a bigger plan. And uh, the, the day with my mother, we expected with the age, but no way did we ever plan on losing our son two weeks later. You know, God, like I told Karen, had a bigger plan than what we did. And I, I believe that there's, there's reasons for everything. And that's the reasons why we're down here. And we was looking for a church and we lost two loved ones, but we gained hundreds mm -hmm. of new loved ones here.
Living the vision for me means um, taking the community that's here uh, and spreading it, um, inviting the community in, um, being more than just a church, more than a place where we worship and, and hear preaching, but really where we live life together. It's a place where we could do activities that are God-centered. Just a hub of activity that's just always buzzing. Just the, the center of the community. I think we've met capacity. Um, our youth is just growing and um, we just need more space. As a parent, the kids not being in the same building as you are, I think is huge. A, a larger building would be a great place like a spoke in the wheel to go out there and then share what it is that God's doing in our body. The new church is at a prime location and there's all kinds of activities and all kinds of parents going through there all the time. So you could just have someone that has never even seen the church be wanting to pull in there and go. It would just be an awesome location right in the center of everything that's going on now. We look forward to seeing new families, new adventures, and we're part of that. Living the vision is all of us coming together to become one body, one church. To be a part of what's next, like to be a big part of moving that forward so that you can look back as you're older, like when we're grandparents one day, and say, oh my gosh, like we had a huge part, and look at what's come from that. That's what makes the difference to me. This is all of our dreams uh, because we're all involved in this. Invest your talents, your, 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 your finances, your, your time. Um, just give whatever you can to help make this dream work. We all need to come together as one. We hope you were encouraged, motivated, and inspired today by the message. And again, man, we believe in you. We believe great things for you. It's because of many people's faithful giving that we're able to go out around the world. If you choose to invest in Barefoot Church, just go on over to barefootchurch.com. You can give there. But go out, live your purpose, and be inspired in a great, great way.